Good evening, everyone. My name is Jenny, and I am with the Tampa Hillsborough County Public Library. Tonight, I am joined by Natalia Guerrero, a graduate of MIT and current PhD student in the Department of Astronomy at the University of Florida. Natalia's research interests include the study of planets beyond our solar system and the story of their birth, evolution, and death. Natalia is also a test science consultant for NASA's Transisting Exoplanet Survey Satellite at the MIT Gvali Institute for Astrophysics. Wow, that was that was a lot. Very impressive, Natalia. <laughs> Thank you. Before we get into tonight's program, though, I would like to give a couple of book shout outs. For our younger readers, we recommend the book Bat Count, A Citizen Science Story by Anna Forrester and illustrated by Susan Detweiler. And for our more advanced readers, we recommend Citizen Science, How Ordinary People Are Changing the Face of Discovery by Karen Cooper. You can find these items in our catalog at hcplc.org slash books. We'd also like to give a resource shout out this evening to our Realia collection specifically Travel Scope 70, which is perfect for observing wildlife, birds, and scenic views during the day, and you can also use it at night for astronomical observing. The Travel Scope 70 can be borrowed from the Sefner Mango Branch Library or from our downtown John F. Germany Public Library. You can borrow it for three weeks. Just a reminder though, that Realia items must be returned to the same library from which they were borrowed. So now it's time to learn how you can become a citizen scientist. I'll be turning my camera off, but I'll be back at the end for the question and answer session. And I'm turning it over to you, Natalia. All right. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Natalia Guerrero. I am an astronomer, so I study the night sky, space and lots of the things in it and I'll talk a little bit more about what that means later but I wanted to talk to you all tonight about how you can be a citizen scientist or if there's a, a scientist aspiring scientist in your life how you can help them find their way into the sciences basically from your own desk or couch you don't even have to leave the house so first I wanted to talk a little bit about what is citizen science so citizen science is also known as community powered science or public engagement science. And so what it means is that you as a person, a member of the public are gathering data and or analyzing that data in collaboration with scientists. So this can mean something like observing your own surroundings. And I'll talk about a project that does that. Or this could mean exploring real science data using your phone or using a computer and collaborating with thousands of people online to do that and help scientists get real results from uh, this data. So um, there's something for everyone. So there's all sorts of different projects in, uh, that are available for participation by citizen scientists. I'm gonna talk about a little bit about each of these. Uh, because I'm an astronomer, I'm probably going to be a little bit biased to astronomy, uh, but I do want to prove to you that there is something for everyone. There's even citizen science projects in doing, in going into ancient documents, historical records. So if that's more your speed or you think you know someone who's interested in that, there's also projects in that. One of those is this Scribes of the Cairo Geniza. Uh, and I checked that out and it's really cool. You're, you're looking at ancient Arabic and Hebrew writing and, and trying to classify it. And I don't know either of those languages and I was still able to make a contribution. So it goes to show there, there really is something for everyone. So the first tool I wanna to talk about is called Zooniverse. And Zooniverse is this online platform that you can access from your computer or your phone. And it has all sorts of different um, projects on different areas in science. And I think um, we'll have a link in the chat for you for that. So in this first project, I've brought up a screenshot of what the interface looks like. It's called Wild Watch Kenya. And you can probably spot at least one, one wildlife 
in that image. So um, that's your first challenge. But that's basically what you're doing as you're looking at these images from the um, from a, a wild area, a nature preserve, and you're trying to catalog both wild animals and livestock and trying to understand um, this is a habitat for giraffes. And the people who have taken these pictures are trying to understand what's happening to the giraffe population over time, how is it being impacted by other animals over seasons, and so this is a really valuable contribution to helping with ecology and endangered species. Uh, so that's one example. And this project, as well as the next project I'm going to show you, which is called NASA's NemoNet, both of these, what you're doing is you're labeling images and looking for features in them. And this is in collaboration with supercomputers, which can also be trained to identify images. But first, humans have to label them so we can teach the computers what they're looking for. Because it turns out humans are still much better at identifying images than computers are. So we're still winning the race against the robots. So this next platform is a game you can play on your phone. And I have tested this with my own phone. And I can confirm that it's really, really fun. And so this is a collaboration with NASA using a advanced underwater camera called FluidCam uh, to understand coral reefs and how we can identify these with machine learning um, and satellites. And there's even structures on Mars that look kind of like coral um, and have similar structure. And so by training computers to identify coral, uh, we can actually use that to classify Mars imagery more efficiently. So this uh, is really exciting also because you learn to identify different kinds of coral. And if you've ever been to the beach in South Florida um, or to a coral reef or see one at the aquarium, it's really cool to finally be able to identify, I know what that is, I know what that shape is, and it's, it's a really exciting thing to do to help understand our oceans. Another app that I have used that is also really fun, if you want to get up and go outside, um, explore your own environment, is called the Globe Observer Program. And so it's a couple of different flavors. There's clouds, there's land surveys, you can even look for mosquitoes if you're really brave. Um, I don't like mosquitoes, so I would avoid that. But um, if you want to, if you really like bugs, that's a really exciting one to check out. So right now they're having a cloud challenge this month through the end of next month, where you can observe, go outside and take pictures of clouds in your environment and where they are in the landscape. Because NASA's weather satellites also are looking at these clouds from above. And so the data that we have from the ground matching the data we have from above helps us improve our algorithms, improve our software for understanding how well we're capturing the movement of clouds. And this helps us with weather, this helps us with climate studies. It's really valuable. So if you want to get out into your environment, I really recommend this program if you're a budding meteorologist. So next I'm going to switch gears and I'm going to talk a little bit about astronomy. And in particular, my own research, I am an exoplanets astronomer, which means I study the planets around other stars, so not the planets around our sun, everything outside of that. So how do we w detect planets around our sun? We can't just take a picture of them. They're too far away. Their stars are too bright. So what we do is we actually look for a change in the brightness of the star. So when a planet crosses in front of its star, um, the light from the star is blocked out a tiny bit by that planet, less than a percent most of the time. So a bigger planet will make a bigger dip. A smaller planet will make a smaller dip. We call those dips transits. And you'll hear this word a little bit more as I continue talking. So we use telescopes on the ground and in space to measure these transits, uh, these changes in brightness of the star over time that tell us there's a planet there, it's this big, its year is this long, and we can use that to understand the planets in our galaxy. So the data I showed you there was very nice and clean. The transit was a nice, beautiful dip. But in reality, as the planet is crossing in front of its host star, the data looks a lot messier. And so we have to use algorithms. We have to use software, computer code, to help us recognize when a transit is happening. And we have to do this for thousands and thousands and thousands, even millions of stars at a time. So we need computers' help to do this type of analysis. 
But then humans and computers need to go back and look at these transits and try to identify what's a transit and what's just the star doing its thing. So the first telescope to do this in space, um, that was a really big mission um, that's very well known. It's not the first telescope to have done this, but the first really well known one was Kepler. So Kepler was the telescope that found that we actually are surrounded by thousands of exoplanets. They're not a rare phenomenon, they're really common. And we are one of many different kinds of exoplanets. There's giant exoplanets, there's small rocky exoplanets. So Kepler led the way. And then the next mission that I wanted to talk about is um, the mission that I worked on, TESS, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. I worked on the cameras for TESS, so the four squares you see here are the outer <coughs> cones shielding those cameras. So I worked on the cameras and I also worked on the catalog of exoplanets that TESS has found. So we found over 100 so far and we expect to find thousands more. So how can you help with this telescope that's in space, with this data that was taken almost a decade ago? What can you do? Um, you can actually contribute to this as um, a citizen scientist with planethunters.org. So data from the TESS uh, mission is currently being uploaded to this website, and you can classify transits and say, this is a transit, this is not a transit, and actually help discover exoplanets. This is something that I'm going to show you what we have found. And there's quite the track record um, for finding exoplanets with tools like Planet Hunters. Um, and this is also a really exciting for opportun opportunity for astronomers who are new to the field, who are just getting started. This platform for TESS was run completely by a graduate student, a first year graduate student, Nora Eisner. And this has been her project for the last couple of years. So this is um, a really amazing opportunity, not only for citizen scientists, but also for emerging scientists who are doing this for their studies. So Kepler, uh, one of the most notorious and most mysterious stars in the universe was actually discovered by citizen scientists. Known as Tabby star or Boyajian star, this star was uh, published by um, Tabitha Boyajian in 2016. And this star had a really mysterious light curve. The citizen scientists saw all of these transits that didn't look like a planet, they didn't look like two stars, they didn't look like normal star behavior. So they said, what is this? It was this big mystery. So uh, eventually, with additional analysis, uh, we've come to the conclusion, maybe these are planetary fragments left over from collisions, maybe these are exocomets, but there's still a lot of mystery here. So right now there's a team of over 50 citizen scientists with telescopes all over the world contributing data to better understand the star that the scientist is leading. She even started a Kickstarter to raise more money to point robotic telescopes at the star. So this is an amazing example of what you can do with community field science. Uh, you can understand systems like this really mysterious star. I think I really, I really like this story. It's a good uh, Tess has also used uh, the citizen science discoveries. The first uh, discovery from Planet Hunters Tess was a Saturn-sized exoplanet. Um, the another exciting one was the first circumbinary planet. So a planet that has two suns, kind of like Tatooine in Star Wars. Um, the first one that Tess found was actually found by a high school intern who noticed that the transits from the two stars orbiting each other looked different from this additional transit coming from a planet transiting the two stars. And so in this video, you see the planet transits are in green and the star transits are in red. And a computer wouldn't be able to tell the difference, but by eye, this student was able to do this. And he was a high schooler. So this goes to show, this is really something that, um, we welcome public contribution to. And this keeps happening. Uh, the latest was published just this month in January, a Jupiter-sized exoplanet that was discovered by citizen scientists, um, one of whom was a retired uh, former naval officer. So um, this one was really exciting because again, computers missed it, uh, but this team saw that this planet transited just one time. 
during the whole observation period with TAS. And so they saw this big deep transit that the algorithm missed and said, hey, we think this is something and worked with professional scientists and telescope observers and published this Jupiter-sized exoplanet just this month. So if you didn't say, if you thought that that was all that there is for exoplanet citizen science, uh, there is more. Uh, a couple of other, I don't have time to talk about all of the different um, exoplanet projects that are out um, for you to work on. There's a few more, uh, but this is just one more. This is the Next Generation Transit Survey, and it's 12 telescopes in Chile that you can see in that little video there. And they are looking for exoplanets as well, nearby, around nearby bright stars. And so you can go onto their platform on Zooniverse, again, uh, Planet Hunters is also on Zooniverse, and look for exoplanet transits and dive into the exciting world of finding new planets. Um, speaking from personal, from experience, uh, one of my collaborators in my current research at the University of Florida, Kadri Chance, um, this is actually how he, part of how he got interested in astronomy was when he was in middle school, he was part of the Planet Patrol Citizen Science Project, um, or I think Planet Hunter Citizen Science Project. And um, as a professional astronomer, he's collaborated with the Planet Patrol Citizen Science Project. And so he has come full circle from citizen scientists now to professional astronomers. So this is really a pathway to entry into astronomy. So to wrap up, um, this is, these are all of the links to all of the projects that I have mentioned in this talk. This is a really good slide to screenshot if you're on your computer um, or on your phone. So I would really recommend getting, grabbing a screen cap of this, but I think also uh, we are dropping all of these links in the chat. Uh, but this is really easy. Right after this talk, you can just open up a browser and log in and get started. So I think I will stop there and we can we can have a conversation. We can take any questions. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Natalia. Um, real quickly, at the beginning of the broadcast, we had a little bit of um, a technical issue with the sound. So I wanted to make sure that everybody knew that if they had any questions that they wanted to ask Natalia, go ahead and drop those in the chat and I'll relay those to her. Um, so with that, we have someone that is curious to know when they're participating in these citizen science programs, they don't actually need physical equipment, correct? They are like looking at things that have already been collected and trying to to find patterns or or something like that yes every project i have talked about here all you need is your computer or your phone um every there are projects where you can collect water samples or take specimens um, i didn't talk about those but those exist if you once you get your your vi your groove and you want to try something new but for all of these you just need access to the internet that's great. That's great. Um, and there's programs for all ages, so a family could participate in something together? Definitely. All of these are, are very easy to do and really fun, actually, to do together. That's neat. Um, do you know if schools have ever participated in one of these citizen science projects? And could you do it as a group? I think you could totally do it as a group. A lot of these projects are run by like I mentioned, like this graduate student or a small team of scientists, and they're always happy to have organized focused efforts helping out. And so if you have a school group or a homeschool group, like it would be um, speaking as someone who has organized a big classification project, having a big group like that is awesome. And I would strongly encourage reaching out to a project you're interested if that's the case. That's cool. Um, would you explain what transits are again, like in a nutshell? <laughs> sure. So let's say this is my star and this is my planet and my planet is going around my star. From your point of view, for a short while, the planet crosses in front of the star and the star is emanating a lot of light. And so you may have experienced this when a family member crosses in front of the TV when you're watching it. 
um, but they block out a tiny amount of the star's light. And so um, that is called a transit, when the planet moves across the face of the star. Thank you, that was a very good explanation. Let me see if we have any other questions popping up. So do you know if there are any citizen science projects that study bird migration? I, I would say probably. <laughs> On Zooniverse, I definitely saw a few that um, study different kinds of birds and using, again, like um, cameras that are left out in a, in a wild habitat um, to take pictures of birds. So those definitely exist. Um, but I would recommend maybe looking up your local chapter of the Audubon Society or looking at the local university to see if um, there's something a little bit more focused. Will do. Let's see. Can you start a citizen science project on your own? Yes. <laughs> um, a lot of these data are public. Um, I can speak, uh, my area of expertise again is exoplanets and all of the exoplanet data are completely public, you can download them whenever you want. And there's a lot of tools that exist for analyzing that data. So if you get started, you can get started very easily using like the Python programming language and just look through the, the data yourself. That's totally possible. That's really neat. Let's see, another one came in here. So, this is a good question. How is it, do you think, that a high school student was able to tell that an exoplanet had two suns if the technology didn't notice it? So that's a that's a really good question. Um, I would so again, this student um, was a what was it? he was working as an intern um, with a NASA astronomer. So he had a little bit of the background training already. Uh, but what he worked on was um, looking at the depth of, you have two stars and when the stars pass in front of each other, it's a very deep transit. It's like half a third of the light is blocked out because it's two luminous objects. And then when the planet transits, it's a much smaller transit. So that's one way you can tell is that the, they're different depths. And if they're happening kind of at the same period, um, the, the algorithm may not be able to pick that up. It's, um, it's only as sensitive as we tell it to be. And so sometimes it, it misses these things. It says, oh, these transits all look the same. These must all be from the same object. But somebody looking by, I can say like, hey, I don't think they're happening quite at the exact same time. So maybe this is something, something something's not quite right here. That's, that's really neat. Um, so I'm going to switch gears just a little bit um, because you were with us last month when we talked about the James Webb Telescope. Yes. And I know today that Webb reached its L2 point. Um, yes. So yeah, I was going to say, are you pretty excited about that? And what's what's going to happen next now with Webb that it's made it to its destination and everything's working? I am so excited, first of all. Uh, this is a huge accomplishment. There's a giant checklist NASA has of all the things that can go wrong, and none of those things went wrong. So that's amazing. So the next thing that will happen is that the telescope will slowly cool down and get to the temp same temperature as space, and um, it will hopefully start taking its first images very soon. I'm not super clued in on um, the the day-to-day -day calendar of Web. I believe if you go to the NASA Web website, <laughs> um, you can you can get the the really detailed calendar. Uh, but presumably, it'll start taking its commissioning data. Basically, how's the camera doing? How to do after launch? Um, that's generally what telescopes do right after they get to space. That's what TESS did, was we had a couple weeks of commissioning where we said, okay, let's try and understand how the telescope and the camera is behaving and compare that to the data we took the last time it was in the lab. Um, and then once you're convinced that your commissioning data matches your lab data, you can say, okay, scientists, let's start with the first project. Let's start looking at um, stars and galaxies and all the things that we are planning to look at. 
That's so fascinating. I know I've been watching the news for updates on web and when I saw it had made it there today, I was like, oh, I bet Natalia is so excited that it's finally, finally made it. Absolutely. A million mile journey without mm -hmm. any hiccups. It's amazing. It really is. I'm like so proud. I have like secondhand proudness for all Yay. of the scientists I'm working on it. Let's see if we have any other questions. I don't see that any other questions have popped up. So I'm just going to remind the viewers to check out the chat section for links. Um, I hope everybody was able to grab a screenshot of Natalia's slide. Um, if you weren't able to grab a screenshot, remember that this is a recorded webinar. So once it gets posted to our YouTube channel, you'll be able to watch it and then take a screen capture when it is playing. Um, so Natalia, again, thank you very much for sharing your expertise with us. It was a fascinating program. And I know that there's definitely some things that I would like to look at as a citizen scientist and see how I might be able to participate in, in some of these really cool sounding programs. Um, so thank Great. you again for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Take care. All right. So everybody, thank you for joining us tonight. If you need to contact the library in any way, you can reach us by phone at 813-273-3652 or hcplc.org slash contact. And we also highly recommend that you explore our upcoming events and classes at hcplc.org slash events. We would also like to know how the library has impacted your life. We'd love to hear your stories. You can submit them to us at hcplc.org slash stories. And that's everything we have for tonight. So everyone have a good evening. Take care. See you later, Natalia. Bye.